I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Preston Community Club. It's been a couple of years since we were able to hold events here, so it's kind of nice to be back in the building. My name is Bill Stalley. I'll try to uh, moderate this uh, fine gathering as we get along going. I'd like to introduce the, uh, the president, vice president of the club, uh, community club. That's Beth Hatcher. She's over there. And then Echo Murray. Most people know where going. And, and Chuck over there. So, so welcome, welcome to the community club. What we're going to do tonight is obviously a list of the candidates. And so we're going to have some ground rules here. Everybody has an opinion, and that's great. But we're going to be respectful of that opinion. Everybody who gets up and gets wants to have a question answered, you'll have that chance. If you have an opinion, you can state it. But I don't want anybody else going up and saying, hey, hey, hey. that ain't going to happen. So, okay? We're all going to be nice. We're all going to be respectful. And these guys, too, same thing. They will be respectful of each other in their positions. Because none of these people are in office right now. So if you have a beef about a county commissioner or something that's happened, don't give it to them. You can ask them a question on maybe how they would handle that situation. But they're not in office now, so whatever you said for a beef wouldn't make, make much of a difference. So we'll introduce, we'll have them introduce themselves. And what they're going to do is we're going to give them five minutes. Each one of them will have five minutes to introduce themselves and to tell you why they're the best candidate to be uh, elected for the county commission. We have, most of these guys are for position one, which is um, an expired two-year term, two term. And then we have one that's running against Kelly Bimpy Morris, and he's running for the four-year term. So without further ado, we'll get with Todd. I think Todd is back here doing his, uh, his okay. thing. So you want to keep going? Keep going. Okay, we'll start with Alan. Alan, if you want to uh, come up here and give your five-minute speech of why you need to be the next county commissioner. It's on. You're good. You're good to go. Well, I'm assuming we start with an introduction of ourselves. Am I wrong? Is that, is that better? Uh, my name is Ellen Headley. I've lived in Bonanza for 12 years. At the age of 13, I worked on the farms, milked the cows, uh, onions, potatoes, cucumbers. Uh, that's how I earned my way through boarding school. And then from there, I enlisted in the military and spent my three years uh, as a Vietnam vet. I uh, fought for my disability. I finally received that. Just that effect about a year and a half ago. Long time coming. Uh, I'm happily married and blessed to be married to a wonderful wife, Althea, for 18 years now. Uh, we've got a wonderful son that we adopted, David. He now resides and works uh, at the Barstow Marine Base as a supervisor. Uh, we have, uh, and we're also blessed. I forgot, almost forgot we're blessed with two wonderful grandchildren. <laughs> My wife misses them dramatically. Uh, after high school, uh, I studied blueprint reading at the San Bernardino Valley College. And then in 1984-85, I built my custom home in Angeles Soaks, California. I uh, graduated from the San Bernardino Sheriff's Academy in 1985 and then worked in the local area with uh, High Angle Mountain Rescue over the side uh, with the Sheriff's Department uh, until approximately 1995. I began working in construction uh, with my father-in-law, which sometimes wasn't a great idea. Uh, for the next 12 years, and then I was offered a job working uh, in Universal City in LA. Working co coordinated with the directors on multi-million dollar budget projects, along with keeping uh, the infrastructure working at all times, implementing safety protocols and identifying areas of corporate, li corporate liability. 
2002 to 2005, continued to work on my criminal law degree at Antelope Valley College. During that time, I worked uh, for attorneys for four years, and I had some fantastic mentors. During the time I worked for the attorneys, um, in depositions, mediations, and trial work. 2006, I passed my general contractor's license and began working for myself. And in 2008, we all know what happened there. Um, things kind of went fell, fell apart. But I was able to pull it together until 2010, where I went to work for solar companies for a couple of years, and I got very familiar with uh, what they do and how they do it, and why they sometimes aren't so successful. In 2013, I retired from the motion picture industry, received my state certification to teach voter safety classes to the children and adults of Klamath County. And by the way, we did come up here too. And I loved those little kids when we taught them the book school class. Um, I miss this county. I used to come up with Darren Craig, Small Boat Rescue, and Ron, uh, the Crescent, and any of the other bodies of water you have up here. Uh, every once in a while, we get treated to a nice fish dinner. Uh, but uh, hopefully one day, soon, I can come back and I can make myself more familiar constantly to you. Thank you very, very much for your time, and uh, I will definitely be on the water. Thank you. Thank you. I missed a couple of things. For those of you who need to use the restroom, it's through that door and uh, to your right. Women's is up front, men's is in the back there. Also, uh, we have our timekeeper over here. Beth is going to keep the time. So you guys will, if you kind of glance over Beth, she'll give you a one minute warning. And if you go over your time, she has a ballot over there. So you, you or me, one of the two. And uh, that'll be the end of your time. So if you want to write down a question, we also have some cards for you. Uh, Echo has uh, some 3 by 5 cards. Please write legibly. If you want to give your question out by yourself, that's great. If not, one of the girls will read it for you. Okay? Any questions on what I've done so far? Because I've already forgot a bunch of stuff, obviously. And we'll just keep going. Todd, would you like to go now? Oh, I'm sorry, Al. I almost forgot the most important person. Echo, thank you for putting us all together. We owe you a hand. Todd and Wesley. Yes, Lee. Yes, Lee. Yes. I knew the W. I've got the W in there. There you go. <laughs> you got five minutes, Todd. Well, it's good to be here. I'm running on a theme, so Klamath rises. And someone walked in and said tonight, they said, does that mean South Klamath rises? And no, North Klamath must rise as well. And uh, so it's good to be here. I'm Todd Gessley. I'm a f uh, fiscal conservative, constitutionalist, husband, father, and owner of Totally Inspired Media. So I'm a little bit of a journey up journalist that has a production company. I was educated in Southern Oregon at Milo Adventist Academy, and that's where I met my wife, Gianni, who's running a camera back here. Uh, she grew up in Tumalo, Oregon, near Bend, and our son, Christian, is 15 and goes to Climate Union. I graduated from Walla Walla. University in 1992 with a BA in communications and business minor. I earned my PMP project management professional master certificate in 2007. And last month I passed my general contractors Oregon board um, at Klamath Community College. Um, so feel free to pull out your phone and look up Electod G. You may have more questions as the night goes on. You can look at my site there. Uh, it might spark, spark some questions for you to ask. I love Oregon. I've lived here 42 years of my 52 years. Um, I have 21 years of nonprofit leadership, nine years as a CEO and entrepreneur. I've worked in 42 countries around the world on assignment for different clients, mainly promoting healthcare, education, and fighting government corruption. Um, I love diversity, and I don't like government corruption. I'm an advocate for fair and swift justice, healthcare, education, and being tough on crime. In this race, I'll be a first-time public servant, haven't served before, so I'm coming from the private sector with a lot of grant writing background. 
I don't have any ties to the basin to, uh, as far as you know, good old boy style politics. I'm brand new, I'm fresh, and it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And the next uh, candidate that we have is, is Jane. Oh, we're going to go right down the line, Jane. So you want to go for two? Oh, okay. So James is the only candidate that's running for position two, which will be against Kelly Minkley Morris, who's the present incumbent. Thank you. You are welcome. So. Oh, yeah, sir. We can help. Yep. Now we have. Uh, you told me. Drum roll, please. <laughs> My memory is getting this long. I'm Dave Hensley. Yeah, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Well, good evening. This is a great turnout. When we were driving up here today, my, uh, my buddy Joe in the back was on the camera. He and I were trying to guess how many people would show up. And, and I said 25. He thought more. So, Joe, you got me beat. This is a great turnout. Thank you for the invite, Echo. This means a lot to me to be able to be up here. I'm Dave Hensley. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I can talk, so five minutes is going to go real quick, and I'll probably use most all, all, all your five minutes. I'm married to an amazing wife. Her name's Benji. We've been married almost 29 years, and we've raised three incredible, beautiful, and just amazing daughters. They're all adults now and have moved out of the house. Um, my walk with God is very important to me and very personal, so that's something I carry with me um, at my side all the time. I live my life with three main principles. I would like to tell you those. Number one, um, number one is to value people, all people, everybody, every walk of life, value people. Number two is find strength in your differences. We don't always have to agree on everything that's being said, but we need to find strength in each other and have a good relationship to listen to people. And number three, be accountable to other people. You'll hear a lot of times be accountable for your own actions, and I think that's really just selfish. So I like to be accountable to other people. My wife and I own and operate 5-H cattle company outside of Merrill. We find a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, pride in living the rural lifestyle, and we find a great sense of pride in developing our brand into a symbol of trust and respect in our community. I was a dedicated and committed public servant for 28 years as a police officer. I retired last year as the chief of police for the city of Klamath Falls. As the Chief of Police, I was responsible for writing, developing, presenting, and managing multi-million dollar budgets. In the first couple of years that I was the Chief, I actually held that budget flat and didn't ask for any additional taxpayer money. I was responsible for leading, inspiring, and motivating, and empowering about 50 staff. And those were, those were sworn police officers down through our cadets, people that would like to be police officers someday. As the Chief of Police, I was the um, co-chair of the Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Institute. I was and still am on the board of directors for the Oregon Accreditation Alliance, and I was a district representative for the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. I graduated from Oregon State University. Go Peace! Go I know, I just gotta throw it out there. I believe black and orange, I'm extremely proud of my school. I'm, I've got a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science, and I think that's hilarious to tell people I have a BS in politics. <laughs> I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy. I spent three months in Quantico, Virginia, studying executive policing and, and different ways to police and, and do great good in the community. And I also am a graduate of the Oregon Executive Development Institute. I finished my mid-management certificate uh, for policing at the Mark Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. So why do I want to be a commissioner? That's really what this boils down to, right? I don't need another career. I don't need another job. But I'd like to be a Klamath County Commissioner for you. Because I think somewhere along the way, we lost the voice of the people in politics. When I was the Chief of Police, I designed and developed the Community Police Advisory Team. And I met with my community and asked them, what's important to you? And I based our policing philosophies and our styles and our practices based upon what you wanted. Because at the end of the day, it was about you, not me. And I'm approaching government with the exact same mindset. It's about you. It's not about me. We the people. Government is for the people, by the people. And we've lost that somewhere along the way. That's where I'm running for I'm the County Commissioner. God bless you. My name is Dave Hensley.
Okay. Continuing on with position one, we have Brandon Fowler. Brandon. We've got five minutes, Brandon. Well, thank you. Good turnout tonight, as uh, Mr. Hensley mentioned a minute ago. It's good to see a lot of faces. We haven't had good turnout in all of the forums we've been to, so it's good to see the interest. I see some familiar faces. Um, I've lived in Klamath County now for 20 years. My wife and I own a ranch just east of Chiloquin and been here for a number of years. Uh, for 25 years, I've served as a, in the private sector uh, in the telecommunications industry with companies like AT&T and Verizon. Most of that time in senior leadership and, and executive roles. Um, for the last three years, I've served as Klamath County's emergency manager. And so I've been on the front lines and seen a lot of the struggles that we see all through this county with the wildfires and, and things that we've seen. It's been many long hours on the bootleg fire. Um, in the middle of that, we had the Darlene fire up here and it affected a lot of, a lot of you folks in this room. So we've worked to try and improve and get better every single year. Um, I'm proud to say that I, I get up here a couple of times, probably three or four times a year working with the fire chief and uh, the folks over at Walker Range. Um, it's good to, uh, good place to be back up here with familiar faces. So, with that, uh, my wife and I have three wonderful kids. Uh, two of them are grown. Both, both my oldest boys are firefighters in the Chilliquin area. Uh, my daughter in the back of the room on, on the camera tonight is um, working some media and she'll be a senior next year at, at high school at Eagle Ridge and, and Climate Falls. So, looking to go forward into media production as well. So happy to be here tonight and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Just, to, just so you know, the only thing I'm running for is to get out of work. <laughs> okay, next we have Brian Laporte. Brian, you have five minutes. All right. Good evening, everybody. Nice to meet you. I am not running for county commissioner. I'm running for House District 55. Um, at the counties were not redrawn, so they have the same geographic area that they've had forever. Um, but uh, last year, all of our house districts were redrawn. And 55 is a district that runs out to Alfalfa from east of Bend. Comes down to the Lake County line and then follows the Lake County line back in all the way down to California, including Mellon and, or Mellon and uh, Merrill, uh, Bonanza is in there. Comes back up through Klamath Falls and includes this area here, South South Michigan's County. Um, for the last 10 years, I uh, was a farmer, uh, had a small farm that mostly uh, we started out raising hay, but really got into uh, selling direct market uh, lamb and goat at farmer's markets in Bend, uh, two of the main farmer's markets in Bend, and then had a diversified vegetable operation um, and ran a CSA. So a pretty small farm, but um, that was my, my main gig for the last 10 years. Um, and uh, uh, last year, I had a pretty rough medical year and uh, hurt my back. And my kind of farming was, was I was doing most of the labor. Um, so I tried to do that with a split disc that didn't go so well. It didn't look like it was going to keep going very well. So I pulled out of that. So then this year I decided, you know, kind of saw some time in my hands and, and thought and saw that, that there was a, a race and I could get involved in making this area that we've grown to love, um, uh, hopefully make it, keep it an amazing place that we we know it is, and uh, that's one of the things that I try to carry with me as I'm doing this job is to, is to remember how lucky we are. I'm a military brat, I grew up, and my dad was in the Air Force, so I moved around from place to place, and I moved around on my own for a while. So I've been a lot of places, and I know how lucky we are. We have one of the most play amazing places in the world to be, and uh, we know that because everybody's moving here. Right? And so housing is one of my biggest issues in the district. Housing, you know, housing in Bend affects housing here. Right? People moving to Bend affects the prices of housing here. 
demand our resources. Same thing is happening in the plan of fall. It might be a slightly different uh, how the price level, but the changes in prices are happening everywhere. So I'm trying to just, you know, whittle away at the, pro the challenges to, uh, to these rapid increases of housing so that my kids, I have an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old kid in the Ben Lapine School District, can stay here. You hop around the world a lot, you, you don't know where you're going to land, and you find a place like this, and you want to make this home. Well, you want this to be a place where your kids can stay and build a community, start a business, and grow with the community. Um, and then, you know, having farmed on irrigated ground for the last 10 years, I mean, I'm, I'm also a soil scientist by training. I understand the water issues deeply um, and want to work towards keeping farmers on the ground while conserving every drop of water that we can. Um, and then protecting our houses from wildfire, which is a you know, big issue, particularly in this area. Um, and then making sure that affordable health care is available to everybody, accessible and available. Those are the three top issues that I'm focusing on. But the number one issue, is, as has been said, is listening to you. And that's why I'm here. And I will continue to come here as a representative. I, I really uh, am doing this to be part of the solution. And, and the biggest part of that is admitting that I don't have all the solutions myself. I'm not coming here to tell you what all the solutions are. I'm here to listen to what you see as the problem and what are some of the, the solutions that we can work on together um, to make, to keep this place the quality of life that we've learned, to, uh, that we've grown to expect here to, to maintain. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you, Brian. Last but not least is position two, who's running against Kelly Minky Morris. And that's James Garland. Mike James, you got five minutes. Okay. Yes. Is that set? All right. Uh, first of all, I'll start off with the fact that I also worked at U Universal. But I worked at Universal the tour parts. Okay, I was also uh, basically a soundtrack recording studio where people came in and did their own music videos, audio recordings, and all day long I went, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Soundtrack Universal Studios Tour. Will you become a star? Blah, blah, blah. I wrote this story, or I wrote the, uh, the spiel. But to give you a little background again, uh, yes, I worked at Universal. I also worked at the Lower Lock. Uh, we had to take a standby band down there. But back up, I have an AA degree in theater arts, telecommunications. I've written several different plays that have not been produced. Uh, I have waiting for the right director, the right producer, because I wrote them and I know what the vision is. Uh, I also have a BA in business from Simpson University. I spent uh, also three years teaching English as a second language in South Korea. Uh, I've done numerous jobs. I worked at uh, New Car Generating Manager, Billing Chevrolet downtown, the Los Angeles responsible for 750 brand new cars and trucks. Had 10 quarters under me, underneath me. I also, yeah, but help with the mic on. Uh, I also uh, had 10, 10 quarters underneath me. Uh, I wrote a procedure manual for an aerospace industry company. Uh, I've been in manufacturing, shipping and receiving mostly. I ran an injector molding machine in Sky Lake's uh, recreation products in uh, Redding, California. I also was a radio DJ on KPDAK AM 1230, as well as KP, uh, KLXR AM 1230. Uh, also 103.7 FM, KBOX, uh, AC Music, and then CAR 106 overnights. But I was the last DJ on the air live for 102.7. Right now that frequency uh, is uh, K-Love in the rating area. Uh, I do my own radio show right now on HAPS. Uh, it's, a, it's an app. I do it in the mornings, two hours, and I do it at night, two hours. I also have printed, do my own news. Been doing it for 13 years for free. I don't have any ads because I want to do the stories that I want to do and I don't want to be worried about losing ads uh, because I do a story that my advertisers do not like. Um, I'm going to my list now. 
uh, yeah, been in food and retail. I went to Taco Bell, Jack and Box. Uh, I've also worked uh, home base. They no longer exist. Uh, they're similar to Home Depot. I worked at a liquor bar in Redding, California. Uh, like I said, I've been in management. Uh, let's see what else. I have a long list as far as the resume. I have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge in lots of areas. And um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, and then as far as myself personally, uh, I know people in, in Climate Falls from the less fortunate all the way to people in power, like our, the gentleman over here, the, the, the former chief of police, who knows who I am, I know who he is, okay? I wrote many stories in the past uh, covering the downtown uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, so I was out there doing that, doing videos and stories uh, with a couple of years ago. So a lot of people know who I am, okay? Some people don't, some people are learning who I am. But uh, I'm nonpartisan, no left, no right, no religion, because this is a nonpartisan position. This is about who? This is about the people, not politics, when it comes to making decisions for the county and the people that live in the county. Politics, left, right, religion needs to stay out of it. Make the decisions on the people and what's important for the county. I'm running out of time already. <laughs> One more minute? Okay. I can, I can go on forever here. Uh, let's see, what else do I do? Uh, uh, yeah, and then of course, like the TNT, I had that. You're welcome to take up a copy. I just did one. I had somebody ask me. Uh, what my world view is, okay? My world view, in order to be running for uh, county commissioner. And it's like, excuse me? She wanted like a couple paragraphs. Well, I wrote what I thought. I couldn't answer her at the time. It was on Facebook. And plus, finally, I did a story uh, last week about the, uh, the commission and the planning commission. And after I got done, Kelly came out, my opponent, and gave me a hug, okay? Peaceful, loving. Politics. Stop the hate. Yes. It's, it's old. Okay? It's old. And then I sent it to her Facebook page, and she had thanked me again and for being there as well as for doing the story. That's the way it's supposed to be, folks. Stop all this hate. That's right. Religious point of view or whatever else. This is about the county and the people. I know people are less fortunate. Like I said, the people in power former attorney, uh, she's, a, she, she's a judge now. So, I mean, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Sorry. I get going. Okay, so now we're going to the question period. So, if you have a question of one, two, three, whatever, just make sure you, you tell us who the question is for. If it's all for all of them, then that's fine. Uh, we'll get them one at a time. So, Echo will have one of the mics. You're going to have to do it on a mic so that everybody can hear you. We'll start with you, then we'll go to this gentleman over here. My name is Loretta Feather. I lived in Crescent <laughs> since 2004. Um, the crime here is incredible just in the last, I'd say, five years. My house has been broken into so many times. We feel like in Crescent that we're alone here. It took 45 minutes for a police officer to come to my rescue. I was being assaulted in my house with my disabled husband. It took them 45 minutes to find my house. The dispatcher couldn't even relate to the officer where we lived in Crescent. She really thought that I was making a mistake of Crescent was not a climate fault. So the people here feel like there's no one here to represent us. Why should we care about you when nobody's here to care about us? We have one officer that patrols the entire area from Christmas Valley all the way around. It takes him forever to come to a rescue if we need him. What's going to happen now that we have more people moving in here? And I'm not saying that they're undesirable or they are desirable, but the crime wave has gotten so bad here 
they're willing to steal statues of wood. And there's no one here that we can call that will be here to help us. We need more policing here. I'm not saying be a Gestapo. I'm just saying that we need another officer here for to help be, for one, who is the deputy sheriff here. But we need help here as knowing that we're safe here. So when I lock my door at night, I can go to sleep and not worry about my chickens being stolen, which has happened. Now I have to lock them up with a padlock. I mean, we need help here. And we feel like we're not getting representative people here to understand that we as a community, we matter. Yeah, we don't live in Klamath Falls, but our lives here still matter. And the crime here is terrible. There's no, nobody here to help us. And we feel like we are being just let go, that nobody cares. So is your question for everybody? My question is for everybody. What's gonna, what can we do to solve this problem? We need to hire more police officers, especially here. I mean, we're remote. Did you feel like you got a fair shake when the guys did go to court? No, I did not. So it's not just the police officers. They're not prosecuting right. down there. They're either. not. So they're not they're taking not. care of us. And, and that's what we're we don't want, We're not going to get into a debate here. Right. Yeah. I understand. I understand. I understand. So what I'm get asking your question is, to we need to have more police officers here. Is this going to happen? I mean, we pay our taxes just like the people in Climate Falls. We may not have fancy restaurants and all this stuff, but we still pay our taxes. And we feel like we need to be have somebody here to help us. We need police officers here. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's see if we can get some answers here. Todd, would you like to start off and answer the uh, lady's question? I did talk to Chris Caber, and I know he is asking asking pensioners for eight additional deputies, detectives. So I know he's being proactive on that. He, we do have the one officer up here, but like you say, that's not enough. I was out in Sprague River uh, recently doing some real estate photography, and one of the guys there said, we have three rules. Shoot, shovel, and shut up. And, uh, you know, you, we, that's the beautiful thing about the Second Amendment that we have here. And I'm not saying that's the answer everywhere. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. But, you know, you have to you have to use your rights if you have them. This is the Wild West still. and But as you do grow, um, I will make sure that we address what is happening up here and try to get things, you know, officers put out where they need to be so we can take care of you. That's not happening right now. So thanks for letting us know. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Alan? You definitely make me feel blessed living in Bonanza. I am sorry for the crime rate that's gone out of control here. Um, I can still leave my doors unlocked and leave a car door open and know it's still going to be there in the morning. Not here. I'm not here, obviously. Um, definitely the sheriff's doing what he can. Um, from what I understood, the, even the Marine Patrol's been cut. I don't know what's up with that. But uh, that's something I definitely would look into because, like I said, that's what brings me up here. And I miss the times that I did have up here. I'm glad to hear that uh, you had a camp meeting after three years. That's great news, and I can understand why now. Because if the crime's that bad, uh, I'd like to work with CAP committee and make sure that uh, these problems are addressed through the meetings that you have. And... Find out what the crime rate is, where the, where it's centered, and maybe we can go from there. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Nothing's ever easy. Uh, but with teamwork and people coming together, anything is possible with the support of the county and your taxpayer dollars, which it sounds to me like you've been lacking for many, many, many years. Um, I've only been in the marine part of it, but now that I've gotten into the political part, which this is the first time I've ever run for office in my life, and after 12 years of retirement, I, I saw that there was a definite need, and you reinforced that. Thank you. Um, as far as the funds, uh, there is a lot of infrastructure money. I don't know what it's earmarked for, but I would definitely look into taking as much of that money as I can and putting into law enforcement according to the rules. Don't know what those are exactly yet, but I'm sure some can be used or created to be able to do that. Thank you. Okay. James? Can I just stand right here? 
now that they go back to the we just keep, you know, so it's back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I'm not familiar with the situation here, but just like everything else, there's always money. Money is always a problem, and it's in the budget somewhere. I have no idea. I haven't seen it. Don't have, you know, don't have the slightest idea. But I would almost, and I have a BA degree in business, I would almost say that that's the problem. It's the budget. The money's just not there. For whatever excuses or reasons, that they haven't been able to do it at this point. That's just, I'm not going to argue or debate it either. Uh, that's just from what I understand or know or would think or just basically just a wild guess of the situation. I don't know if it's political or not. I have no idea. And as far as politics, uh, the first time I ever ran, I ran in, for city council in, in uh, Tulane back in 2014. Uh, and I also ran for mayor in 2020, Lambeth, okay? I'm still a newbie when it comes to politics. I'm still learning. In this particular situation, same thing. I'm not familiar with the whole county. At least I had the city before. This, this is a, a lot more to deal with as a candidate as well as a commissioner. And there's a lot of details that I can't answer because I don't have the answers. But my main thing would be mainly it's, it's a money issue and get it organized in order to pay for the officers to be here. That's all I can think of. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Well, this is kind of my wheelhouse. This is what I've studied for 28 years. As a police chief, um, I prioritized the allocation of our staff while minimizing taxpayer dollars. Um, and I feel bad for Darren Bean. Kind of funny side note, Darren Bean and I were reserve police officers together in 1992 in Corvallis. So I've, known, I've known Darren for 30 years, so I'm glad he's here. So I've got a couple ideas to help you out. As I've been cam campaigning, one of the complaints I hear most frequently, and keep in mind, I live in Merrill, I live in a, in a rural community, but the complaint I hear most frequently is there's not enough deputies, and the, the response time for those deputies is horrific. And I agree with that 100%. We have to do something different. Right now, the sheriff has five openings, I believe, that he's trying to fill to get some more deputies on the street. And then he's asked for another $3 million of road funds for eight additional deputies. Um, I support having more deputies, but let me tell you, let me tell you a, different, a different idea. Because I think that we need to get really creative so we don't overburden our road funds and we don't overburden you with more taxes, but at the end of the day, we have to have public safety. If I didn't believe in public safety, I wouldn't be a police officer for 28 years and a police chief. Um, so there's some things that we can do differently. In the urban growth boundary in, in Klamath Falls, right now there's a sergeant on duty and five officers. And there's also a sergeant from the sheriff's office and four or five deputies. So we've got two police forces in a geographical area of about 42,000 42,000 people. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I'd really like to, to take a step back, think about how do we how do we have a contract with the Klamath Falls Police Department to absorb the extra the extra people, let Klamath Falls Police Department police the urban growth boundary and free those deputies up to be deputies in the rural communities. The other idea that I have is let's incentivize these deputies even more. Let's go to deputies and say, hey, you want to move to Crescent? We'll help you buy a house. And let's plant you in Crescent. And if you stay working for the sheriff's office for seven, eight, nine, ten years, whatever you guys think that time ought to be because it's your money, then we forgive a loan. And if they don't, they pay it back at whatever that interest rate is. So there's a way for us to incentivize moving deputies to the rural communities, let the city police police the city, let the deputies police the, the rural communities and minimize your tax liability at the same time. Some of you might have heard that I don't want more deputies. That's nothing further from the truth. We just need to do it more efficiently. I heard the sheriff say just the other day, the way the policing is occurring right now is not fair. And I agree with him 100%. So let's work with the sheriff. Let's empower the sheriff. Let's give him the tools he needs to get deputies out into the rural communities and cough up the UGB to the city police and let them have it. When I was the captain for the Corvallis Police Department, we were policing 60,000 people with a sergeant and four cops. 
Why do we have 10 in UGB? It doesn't make sense to me. Let's think bigger. Thank you, Dave. So thanks for the question. Um, I've been around here a little while. I'm old enough to remember Darren Frank when he was here. Yeah. And the previous, previous sheriff um, did some things that didn't make a whole lot of sense by you know having Darren Frank leave his home up here in Preston every day, drive to Clanton Falls, you know, and be a sergeant and send somebody up here when there was a call for service. Um, one of the other things I've done is I've served on the Plymouth County Budget Committee and started in 2017 when we began reinvesting in our sheriff's office. And one of the things we did was we added more deputies. Um, unfortunately, as you've heard a couple of people allude to, the sheriff has asked for eight more positions in his budget. Um, budget committee voted on that Monday and, and voted to not give him eight more positions. And one of those positions that he asked for was another resident deputy up here. So he's made any case he's asking for it. Chief Hen former Chief Hensley is right. You know, the, these guys have to be more things than what they need to be. Um, the sheriff's office has to be a city police department in Plymouth Falls for half of that town, and they have to be sheriff's deputies for the other 6,000 square miles of this county. And that's not right. Okay, we're, we're making these guys do things that you know they shouldn't have to be able to do. And but at the end of the day, it's going to take more of them. Sheriff's got five open positions; he needs eight more. We can't. We couldn't find them anyway. There's not enough people wanting to get into law enforcement to serve, and that's a challenge. So we need to encourage that, and we need to make it so that people want to be in law enforcement, so they want to serve these communities. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a background in law enforcement, um, and, uh, except for uh, benefiting from it. So thanks for your service. Um, but as a state rep, you know, I feel like my job, you know, as a rural state rep. My job is to, to represent rural areas and rural constituents and to try to move funding and make the argument in Salem, hey, we've got folks here who have issues here and need some resources. So um, some of, you know, the state uh, patrol is kind of under the state budget, so trying to enhance the state patrol would probably alleviate some of the burden of the sheriffs, particularly up and down 97. Um, so try, and I totally support that. Also tying that, with, I think I'm, I'm going to assume, I'm making an assumption, but a lot of the issues, prime issues, are related to drug issues. So drug interdiction on up and down 97 is a big concern in trying to to start to. It's, the, a lot of the issues we're dealing with have been going on for a while and they've been building for a long time. So we've got to start where we are, but we do have to um, get more interdiction um, on you know on these these byways. Uh, so I would support that. And then trying to bring, you know, I would just make the case and basically be your lobbyist, essentially that's my job, is to get out there, hey, we need resources to support the sheriff's office. You know, whether, usually state funds will come in the form of, of infrastructure, you know, uh, or facilities, things like that. So, you know, I don't, and I, I don't know if it's reasonable to ask for a new office in this area, and that would be something I'd have to talk about. Sorry? We did have an office in Gilchrist, but we lost it. And it got lost, so yeah. So let's bring that back. You've got populations rebounding, you're growing, um, and you're sending the resources to Salem to bring them back. To, so that, that's how I would approach my role. Since I'm not a county, I wouldn't be not running for a county job, but as a state representative to help and um, represent you and bring those resources back to help you grow wisely. Thank you, Brian. I have a question over here. Oh, yeah. uh, I knew it was over here somewhere. You're close. You're close. Uh, my name is Alden Andre, and you already addressed one of my concerns was a police department. And I actually went down and talked to the sheriff, and I know the problems getting people up here. But the other thing is, we live five miles from Deschutes County, and they're supposed, they're supposed to have an agreement to come and help us when we want. Never happens. They won't do it. So will you guys represent our county and get those people to use some of their resources to come into our county? The other, the other two issues that bother me here is lack of water. We're running out of water in this town. Um, and that affects my next concern is fire. We have two fire departments. Echo's part of one of them. And then we have a local fire department. We're, surround, we're, we're fire heavy here. 
but we don't have the people. We have four full-time people with our fire department, and that means two people on call at one time. And they spend all their time on 97 scraping Californians off the road. <laughs> so the rest of us, for them to, to meet our needs, we have to get students that we pay for their college, but they have to live at the fire department. But we could use another four full-time staff just in our fire department. Just with our local fire department, let alone that goes, they need more too, because they're the ones fighting our forest fire. So those are my three main concerns living here. We have a lack of police, a lack of water, and a lack of fire departments. And you guys, being down in Klamath Falls, I understand the politics and stuff. There's not very many people here right now. My neighborhood, there's 250 houses. That's 250 families just in one neighborhood, let alone the neighborhood that's across the highway. So there's a lot more people in this community than what's represented here. So we need representation from you guys to represent us up here because it's growing and those are my three main concerns. So if you guys could address the last two concerns, which is fire and water, because we've already addressed the police problem, um, those, that's how, what I like to know. And if, are you going to be up here helping us with it or are you going to deal with just, I listen to you guys in your, your uh, debate down in Clown Falls on YouTube. And I understand Klamath Falls is a lot bigger than us, and you get a lot more money, but we, we have a lot of concerns up here, too. So how are you going to address that? Okay. Questions for all? Yeah. Okay, we'll start back then. Um, you got, Brian, you got the mic, yeah. so go ahead and start. Okay, we'll go back this way. All right, um, so it's similar. I mean, uh, that issue with emergency services is true with fire and, and uh, police. Uh, I can't speak to the shared agreement uh, and why that's not working. I wouldn't be involved in, in that, but that's definitely something that um, that needs to be addressed. I mean, if they're closer to you, they need to be able to. They should be responding, and then you guys work out the bill at the end, right? So, um, but they're. I do know that they're stretched too. So again, from the state level, it's about supporting. Um, and I, you know, I've looked into. Uh, you know, one of the challenges you have these kids um, that I, I, I'm assuming you have the same similar high school program to Lapine, where you have kids that get uh, a granting program, they get education through the community college, and they become fire department, or I don't know if it's in the police as well. But, yeah. but then they they get started and they find a better paying job somewhere else in Libra. So trying to the state, what the state can help is to to. Try to increase again, bring those resources, maybe increase, increase the incentives for them to stay. Um, the other part of this, and this is really not government and sale or even government plan falls, it's it's community trying to have, I mean, it is government in the sense that we can support you guys organizing yourselves. Um, you know, because you know, getting new police officers is a problem, but getting new volunteers in any area is a problem. And keep everybody strapped for time, but we do have to work together and help support community groups and getting people out and doing these jobs. Um, I was talking to the Wildland firefighter who was saying that yeah, they're, all of their volunteer firefighters in that program are 60 or older and they can't get anybody new. So trying to encourage volunteerism would be a big part. Uh, and some of that's not even, it doesn't take a lot of money, it's just supporting those groups, trying to help people organize. Um, so, and then in the sense, that's a similar part of the solution to fire because you guys live in the fire zone. You've got it. So, some of that you have to do yourself. But if you're 60 years old or 70 years old or you had my back last year, that's hard. So, how can we organize groups to help each other out? Help you, you know, um, either thin your, the, the area on your ground, clear brush, um, harden that forest, harden the area around you, harden your homes. Things like that to protect you from the fire because you're the first ones, you're the closest ones to it. So that's kind of my approach is to try to bring people together, help organize, help bring resources to to you to to do that work yourselves. Uh, Thank you, Brian. Brandon. So a couple of things on on this. One of the one of the items, I guess, first off was the Shoots County. I know. The other one of the other hats I wear as as the emergency manager, I'm also the public information officer for the sheriff's office. 
So I understand the relationship between us and Deschutes County a little bit. I know they do come down here, but it's probably, I could count the number of calls per year on my hand, on one hand. So it does happen occasionally. Um, that may be a byproduct of where they are in relationship to the southern edge of their county when we need assistance, things of that nature. So I don't know exactly. But I think there's always opportunity for better collaboration, better working relationships. Um, I know Sheriff Caber does you know, work with all of our partners really, really well and continues to foster those relationships. Um, the other thing on fire, I, we, we've had some forest management issues for about the last 40 years. Uh, we're not going to turn that on a dime, and we're not going to suddenly be able to you know, manage our forests differently and clean up some of the duff and things that we see out in those forests. So we're going to be facing wildfires for, for a while. The best thing we can do is we can do, you know, improve defensible space around our homes. Uh, one of the things that my office has done is working with FEMA for a grant to bring that all, all through Klamath County so that we can, you know, help you guys where you need help or help you with resources to be able to do defensible space around your properties a lot better and hopefully protect you from, you know, wildfire and protect your property. I've been, I've had a front seat to the 242 fire down in Chilliquin uh, a couple of years ago and we've seen this work. So I can, I can take you to a, to a house where a property owner spent two years working on their property, establishing defensible space, and the fire literally went right around his property, and the guy across the street who hadn't lost everything. Okay. And I know both homeowners personally, and they're devastated. So we can do a lot of this heavy lifting ourselves. Sometimes we need help, and that's, that's one of the things I'm already doing today to try and bring programs in, get FEMA money to help us do that. And I think there's more that we can do, there's always more that we can do. But you guys can do stuff too. We need more firefighters. I think it was talked about the, uh, the number of volunteers. We have 18 fire agencies in this county, 16 of them are volunteer in some way, shape, or form. Okay. I'm proud to say both my boys, ages 23 and 18, are firefighters. Both of them started as volunteers. One's a paid firefighter in Chilliquin now. But do the heavy lifting too. We can encourage volunteers within our community, encourage our young people, okay, to get into public safety careers. And we, we all play a role in that. Because that's what's going to help us get out of this. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Dave? You had some really, really cool points here. I'm going to try to touch on all of them for you the best I can, okay? And if I mess something up, talk to me later. As far as cross-jurisdiction, I think that is extremely important. When I was the chief of police in Klamath Falls, the sheriff's office did not have 24-7 law enforcement coverage, even in the urban growth boundary. So when, the, when there was a 911 call, we went. And I was questioned about that by, by a city councilor one time in an executive meeting. And the city councilor had a good point. His point was, why are we spending taxpayer dollars for our citizens when you're going into the UGB to cover? And my response was, there's no way on God's green earth I'm going to sit idly by and watch somebody get hurt. That's just not going to happen. So I'm a huge supporter of cross-jurisdictional um, issues and, as, as, it, it, and as, um, so far as helping each other out. I think that is extremely important. I developed the Basin Interagency Narcotics Team, which is a regional drug team when I was the chief in Klamath Falls. And that team is still in operation today, and I housed it at our department, and we brought in the DEA, we brought in HSI, we brought in Oregon State Police, the Sheriff's Office was on it for a spell, and it consisted of all the jurisdictions. I sat down and uh, wrote agreements with Siskiyou County and Modoc County Sheriffs so our regional drug team could cross state lines because we're right there uh, by California, like you're right by Deschutes County, so they could continue to work the illegal flow of narcotics into our county and we could cross state lines and we could cross jurisdictions. I thought that was extremely important. Um, as far as fire, we've got to do something to mitigate fuels. The Keno Fire Department, I used to live out in Keno, came through one time and said, hey, we've got this federal grant, we want to come through and take out all the underbrush, we'll do 75% of the work, if you do 25% of the work, and I was like, you got it, let's do it. And we went through and cleaned up all of our property, there, was, there were more um, animals, there was much more wildlife, we started growing grass again, it looked beautiful. Um, and if wildfire came through there, my, my property was very defendable. So I'm really interested in seeing how we can expand that across all of Klamath County so you guys aren't uh, being devastated by these wildfires. And as far as listening to you and coming up here and listening, I, these poor guys have heard me say this quote a million times, but I'm going to tell it to you as well. 
Joshua Johnson, he's on NBC, he said, it's not my job to tell you what to think. It's my job to think about what you tell me. And I think that's really important. That's why I established the Community Police Advisory Team to listen to you and develop a police department based on your needs and, and, and expectations, not mine. And I'll continue to do that as your Climate County Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. James? Thank you, Dave. The most experience as far as that I know at the moment, because I'd be knowing that much. But um, for me personally, this is no offense to the other candidates, so this is well qualified. Um, I'm not very familiar with the whole situation because I, I spent time doing the news, doing my reports, and doing a radio show, and haven't dug into all the issues. I'm working on it and I'm willing to learn, okay? And I'm open to that. But just sitting here and listening, my main thing that I'm picking up on is, uh, you know, everybody's always passing the buck. It's always somebody else's job, okay? It was, it's not my job, okay? Uh, not gonna, it's not in the budget. We're not going to do that. Well, why can't people come together and work together as a community? You know, what's the line got to do with it, okay? You're all, we're all humans. Let's help each other. Stop this. Well, I'm not going to do it. It's not, it's not line 29. We're not going to do it in the budget, okay? We just can't do that anymore. You know, it's ridiculous. Come together in this. I could, you guys get so far out. I live downtown. I live on Pitson High. So I have a you know, good sized view or whatever else from where I'm at. But I can imagine being out here in, in the real rural area, what it's like to not have somebody, a police department, a fire department, be able to get to your house or whatever it is, your property fast enough. All because, well, well I'm sorry, it's not, it's not on my side of the line, so we can't do it. I'm like, hello. I mean, do we, can we stop doing that and start working together? That goes for their side as well. You know, work together, figure, do trade. Like when I was in radio, the way that used to work in radio for advertisers is uh, they, would, they would come to the station where they had their product or whatever else, and they offered as a trade so the station could give it away as a prize. Well, why can't there be a trade issue if you have something... I need or can use, and maybe we can trade back and forth. It doesn't always have to be money. It can be bargaining. I mean, that's another way of looking at it, maybe solving the problem. And my also, uh, you know, instead of uh, making excuses, why not find solutions to the problem? I mean, everybody's always got an excuse. Well, it's not my job, or it's not my fault, or, or there's not a mental. Work together. Come together as a group. For the fire department, the police department, the whole ball of wax. Stop the drawing the line. It's not my job. It's not my department. It's not you know. I, I I'm not going to deal with it. It's like what Dave went through with the city. <laughs> you know, stretching and taking care of something that's important. Lives are important. Was it? What's more important? People's lives or the fact that you know how much this going to cost? I mean, that's where I'm coming from. That's my thinking on it. And then I'll hand it over to Alan. Thank you, James. Alan? Well, I think I'll start with the fires because I can definitely relate to that. Um, when it came within approximately three tenths of a mile from my house, uh, it felt like David and Goliath. There's nothing you could do to stop it. And even with the fire equipment I had on board, uh, I began to raise down my own mind. Uh, which is not a good thing. But I will say one thing. Yes, definitely agree. There's power in numbers. And when we come together, we, we can accomplish things that you can possibly imagine. Um, and as far as the water issues, too, um, it sounds to me like there is some type of underground water problem. And I, as a contractor, I have had well drillers come out and uh, coming up here, it's a whole different type of underground water system. Uh, I'd probably end up first hiring somebody or looking into hiring someone local that's familiar with the uh, underground aqua systems and see if we could isolate or come up with a solution of why and how and then possibly address it from there. Um, water conditions can result from miles and miles away from uh, a commercial residential or anything that would impact the underground aquifer 
for hundreds of miles sometimes in some instances. So I would probably start there and find out where it takes me since I am unfamiliar with the aquifer system up here. But I was amazed at where what it does where we live. It's absolutely amazing. Um, as far as uh, going back to the fires, uh, I spent some time over in Rocky Point uh, with some folks. I couldn't believe it. I stopped and I looked at this sign and I, that I asked them, I said, you're, you're looking for volunteer firefighters? Yes, um, we only have one. I went, so what do you do? Well, we hope that somebody will come to our rescue. Uh, these are things that I definitely would like to look into because it seems like the support groups that are supposed to be there that we pay our taxes for are not there. So that's one of the priorities I would look into to find out why and how it's happening and what things we can do to correct it so we aren't at risk and we don't look like or feel like David and Goliath. And losing someone's home to a fire at my age, I don't think I could uh, take rebuilding it again. Um, uh, as far as the law enforcement part of it, I've always pushed for um, reserve deputies. Resident reserve deputies. I don't know how possible it is, but it's an investment that the county can make, and they can send them to school, just like they did me. And then they put you out in the community, and you serve a purpose. And with enough of them, numbers again capped, because if you have 10 reserve deputies out here, now they can all have regular jobs, just like I did. They can be on call. Then you have somebody for support that you can call to help offset these crimes. And believe you me, when they find out there's 10 reserve deputies up here, crime people are going to think different than possibly coming here. They might conceive the thought of going someplace else. And that's not what we want, but if it saves things like what you spoke of, um, yes, I'd definitely be in, be in favor of looking into something like that because Resident deputies that are reserves, they work and live in the community, and we know everyone, and that's what was so unique about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if it's all right with you, I'm going to do a little question and answer for my five, five, five minutes, um, more interactive. Uh, how many of you guys are on, on sewers? Or are, There's no sewer here. You're all in septic. Is that correct? You do have a sewer system. system. Do you have a private wastewater treatment plant here in town? Yeah. Okay, does it make type A drinking water? No. 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 Okay. That would be one of the things I would recommend we look into because we can take that water and use it for irrigation or do other things with it or for fire. We have just started. We have just started. It's only been in a year. Okay, so I'm headed the right direction maybe on that one. Um, so there's that. Um, I like the deputy idea, uh, bring it to town, but also uh, to reach on your point here, you know, so what if we catch them? What are we going to do with them? Right. They've done the crime. And one of the challenges we have is keeping DAs down in Climate Falls to prosecute them because we do kind of an internship type thing and they get paid more money and they go elsewhere. So um, that's one of the things I want to support the DA's office as well and make sure that we have enough people down there to swiftly, swiftly uh, deal out justice. And when it comes to code enforcement, and I mean, we have a lot of places we need to clean up. Climate is beautiful, but there's a, there's some there's some properties around here as you drive north that are awful, yeah. right? Anybody know about any of those? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a there's a kid at OIT that just posted on Facebook, I want to go clean up somebody's trash, nominate some places for me, and he's getting a bunch of kids together and going to do that. And I said, I'll join you. Just let me know when and where. So, you know, we need to start looking at that, having free days for the landfill to bring some of this stuff in, contacting vacant landowners, um, and also, you know, so this is a beautiful place. We've got to work as a community to make it happen, whether that's volunteers or otherwise. We can't expect everybody, we can't need the government to do it for us all. Um, but, uh, you know, we are, if we do serve, we're here to help you guys and, and find resources out of Salem, and I appreciate your, your being willing to help us with that um, as well. So it will be a team, team effort. Um, any other questions or ideas from the audience for me before my? Well, we got we have another question uh, from Echo's going to read the question over. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, we're going to go back to the law enforcement. I think you're probably here. <laughs> um, we've talked about the issues of law enforcement um, and the lack of up here. What is your vision for law enforcement in North Plymouth County? I think I think we've all kind of spoke to that already a little bit as far as vision. We want you to have more. Find, finding the answer is one of the jobs that we'll have to do when we when we get elected. Uh, I'm going to run with Todd on that. We have said a lot about that. And my stated work, I believe in that reserve deputy system because I know it works. It's worked in our communities. Um, as far as anything else, it takes a lot of taxpayer dollars. And so to lessen the burden on the taxpayer dollars, that's why I'm focused on that and where I came from. Um, our county, it was the largest county in California. And we could not have survived without a system in place like that because the taxpayer money was not enough to supply the deputies for the massive area that we had. And it was the only way that we could gain the coverage. Uh, now, it would be great to say, yeah, we got all the money in the world, we can reach out there and uh, make it happen for you. Um, but with dealing with what I've had in the past and worked with in law enforcement, it's, it's just... The burden on the taxpayer is too immense, and it frees up the regular officers to be able to do their jobs better and to respond to more serious crimes. And this this process would be for the local areas. Um, we even went as far as opening some substations, which it sounds like one got closed here. And that would be a central point. It could be someone's business in the back, um, with the radio antenna, uh, make it into a substation. There's liability policies I know that would have to be taken out on it with special permission. Um, but these are all factors that I would definitely look into to further the coverage of law enforcement. And I, I was talking to someone, they said, well, we try to get the shoot to come over. And I said, well, do they? Sometimes, depending on how serious the crime is. Um, and yes, working, maybe, maybe a subcontract with them. Uh, to supply more law enforcement in case of an emergency that it's needed along with the local state police. Anything to help increase in the law enforcement presence and decrease crime to help people live a safer life with your children and your grandchildren. Thank you, Alan. James? Um, I'm just going to pass the buck, okay? Because <laughs> it's, it's already been mostly discussed as far as the from earlier or whatever else is some of the solutions that we're just rehashing the same stuff. It's not going to, nothing new, I don't think, is going to be uh, added to it. But there are people that do have more experience in that area that can answer better than I can. I've touched on this with uh, reallocating staff and making sure that uh, we've got law enforcement coverage throughout the entire county. One of my top priorities, if you grab one of my flyers on the way out, take a look at that. But one of my top priorities is to ensure that we have effective and efficient law enforcement throughout the entire county. It doesn't say on the fall, it says the entire county. The other thing that, that uh, my vision goes even a step further than that, um, I told you in my opening, I'm a board member for the Oregon Accreditation Alliance, and that alliance, what we do is we, we review police agencies across the state of Oregon and Alaska to ensure that they comply with best practices of policing from the national and the state level, and then we award them accreditation standard if they successfully pass that. Um, I, take a, I take great pride in that. The Climate Falls Police Department became accredited as I was the police chief, and we were re-accredited. You get accredited every three years. We were, we were re-accredited right before I retired. So I would like to help the Sheriff's Office in obtaining accreditation as well. So when the deputy did, did show up at your door because you needed it, and they showed up in a timely manner, you knew that they, that deputy was going to provide you a service that you could trust and respect. So that's another part of my vision for the Sheriff's Office. Thank you, Dave. Brandon? So a couple of things really quick. Um, one of the areas is grants, and, and the challenge with grants is you can't run an agency based on grants, you know, the size of the sheriff's office. The other problem with that, too, is that when we go after state grants, we go after federal grants, they like to tell us what we can do with the money. You can spend it on this, but you can't spend it on that. Okay? Red tape, strings attached, all of those types of things. Um, and 
And that's a challenge because last time I checked, the folks in Salem and the folks in Washington don't have a real good idea on how to do policing in Crescent, Chiloquin, Klamath Falls, or anywhere else. So I, there's a lot of challenges with going after that, but it's some of the only options we have left on the table. The Sheriff's Office takes up the vast majority of the general fund dollars available in Klamath as in our budget as it is. And so we have to go look outside that for other revenue sources. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, I, mean, I think we've said a lot of it, but um, you know, my, I I would support you know um, enhancing state patrol on 97 to support the sheriffs um, as a, as a part of that, um, and then you know, I mean, I talked about supporting bringing resources, and you're right, uh, Brendan, they come in as grants and they tend to be focused on things so. Uh, so that's this is me just hearing that there needs to be more flexibility for area rural areas that need to use it. For, I, and one thing we don't grant usually, I mean, we I've never been a state, I've never been a representative of anything. So, um, but states and I, I have, um, and my job as a soil scientist and a teacher, I did write grants, so I know what that feeling is. You get the money, and this is what you got to do. Um, so I'm hearing that there needs to be flexibility. And one thing that they don't tend to do is support personnel. Um, and I, I could see uh, working that flexibility into where, you actually because I think that's a big part of the issue, because we just need more people. We need to be able to bring them in and keep them in. And so even though grants tend to be for infrastructure or facilities or um, hard uh, materials, maybe having um, grants that support personnel acquisition you know, maybe they phase out after five years, but at least gives you somebody in the ground, and then you you do have to figure out as a county how do we get the resources over the next five years to keep this person in town. And that would be a state local partnership. We would, you know, if I worked on those grants or that funding, I would say let the let the talk to the the local um, the people that are in charge in those positions and figure out how this would work so that actually when it comes and funding comes in. And that's basically how I approach the job, is what's the problem? I hear from the people what the problem is. Go find the folks that are working on it, whether you're in the sheriff's office or you're in the fire department. And what, how would this money coming in, how would it be actually be helpful? Because, you know, like you said, they don't have ideas up in Salem. I'll be in Salem. I don't want to be like that. I want to be somebody who has ideas that are based on what's happening on the ground and what would actually be useful. So spend time getting that information from you not just sending money and then, you know, oh great, we've got a new station, but we don't have anybody in it. I mean, there's a station in Bend that's just finally getting enough um, firefighters to fill it. So that doesn't, it didn't make, I mean, now it's good, but for, I think it's been for like five years or something like that, so. Don't want to have that. Thank you, Brian. Echo has, oh, we got more questions, so let me go back to the audience, we'll get back to you, Echo, the other one, did you have a question? Hi. I urge each and every one of you to do your research. Okay? So I've done some research and I'm part of the election integrity. And with the election integrity, I did my research. And out of my research of my candidates, I found one that had foreclosure in his property and something to drug related. And then another one that claimed one restaurant was the cause of crime down Main Street. And I've been in Klamath for 1970, so it's always had a reputation. But yet, in the newspaper article from Herald and News, it said they called this particular restaurant the instigators and called them waiters, and then they had a, a, a racial account against them. And so with that, I'm going to ask my panel, if that were you, would you dismiss yourself from this campaign? So I'll take the first part of that, because you mentioned the foreclosure and you're talking about my family. So I'll specifically answer that. Yeah, briefly, my home was in foreclosure. Two years ago, my wife came down with a devastating illness that left her incapacitated and unable to work for 18 months. Okay, Like many people around Clinton County, we're literally one health crisis away from being devastated, okay? My family's faced that firsthand, okay? 
Okay. So yeah, briefly, we were in foreclosure. I'm happy to say we've refinanced our house and we've worked with our mortgage lender and we've solved that issue. Okay, and we've moved past that. Okay. Um, there's others that have tried to make that big issue in this campaign, but for me, I'm happy to explain it. I'm happy to explain it to anybody that asks. So at the same time, you know, we all have to be cognizant of that. We all have to think and look within ourselves and think about what challenges do we face. Okay. I'm happy to say my wife's better, my wife's back to work, and we're doing well. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a question for all. Okay. No, I feel like she's calling me out second. So Brandon, good job, brother. That was a good answer. I'm proud of you for standing up for your family. God bless you. Um, I find it unfortunate that people want to use things negative about people or against people when they haven't been proved guilty. So this is a great country where people are innocent until they're proven guilty, and I support that. That's a, that's a fundamental way of, of running our, our country and our state. So um, I am currently being sued, myself and three other, I think there are three other people that are still named in the lawsuit from a restaurant downtown. I can't speak at great length on it because it is an active lawsuit. We are still waiting for a judge to make a ruling on that lawsuit. But I will um, tell you this. That establishment has made a claim that they were treated differently than any of the any of the other businesses in downtown Klamath Falls. But yet, uh, we posted four establishments, not just one, and the other three were not minorities; they were Caucasians. So, I'm looking forward to the day that uh, we are fully vindicated and proven innocent. So, when people bring things up like this to try to tarnish my character, I can say, "Told you." So, I'm extremely proud of my 28 year career in law enforcement. I'm extremely proud of being your police chief or the police chief in Klamath Falls and I wouldn't change a thing I did. Crime when I left was down um, downtown, it, was, it had dropped 59%. So I think I made some pretty good decisions. When I got hired, we were ranked as one of the top 10 worst places to live in Oregon. And the fourth year I was there, we were the 15th safest town in Oregon. So I wouldn't change a thing. We're glad that Brandon worked through his problem. He addressed that. And I'm glad, I'm glad he's moving on. Being that I did work for law firms, I do recognize the law and I support it because it has its purpose and it's to protect the people. I do believe it's in Article 11 of the Oregon Constitution. And it does state, even the word may is used, with public monies. Anybody that creates a liability should restrain themselves for running for office. You can look that up, you can interpret it any way you want, but uh, that's what the law says. So in that particular case, um, would I restrain myself from running for a position until that was taken care of? Absolutely, because we believe in the Constitution and we believe in the law, and that's what we stand for. Thank you. And I was in foreclosure uh, a year ago uh, with my house because I'm an international photographer and the pandemic came along. And so I sold my house and I moved to Klamath Falls. And uh, I'm glad to be here. It's happy to be running for office. And, um, you know, we need to come together as a community. And uh, that's one of the things that um, I did break the story. and put out the information because I think people need to know as a journalist uh, what we're struggling with. But at the same time, you have to number one, know, recognize what's going on, and then come up with a solution. Fortunately, Brandon solved the solution before we were able to ask the community to do a GoFundMe. So, you know, those are some things that, that's where my heart is, is we're trying to help people. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty. And so I'm good with that, but at the same time, there's no harm in saying there is a pending, there is a pending case, and let's look at this and find out what it's all about. So, thank you very much. So, just for clarification, we put out a statement on our website when the foreclosure happened, long before any stories broke or any of that kind of stuff. So, I just I want to be clear about that. We were completely transparent about it up front. Um, the other point that was brought up, I think, about some sort of drug use or something on my property. Um, I can tell you, I've owned that property for over 20 years. And there has been absolutely no production of any illegal substance 
any time, not 20 years that I've owned it. Okay? Prior owners, there may have been an issue with it prior to me owning it, but that was not why I've owned it. So I just wanted to make the last part. I don't have much to add to this one, but uh, other than to say that uh, I really do support, I mean, I recognize that um, a lot of us are uh, one, you know, I feel very lucky, actually, to have had health insurance. My wife works at St. Charles, so we got health insurance. So her, I don't know what I would have done. Last year, I had three back surgeries last year. And, I mean, even with that, you know, we have a high deductible plan, and it's empty now. Um, so we got lucky because we had kind of the catastrophic insurance. So, uh, yeah, a healthcare crisis can get you really close, really fast to being completely broke. And I, I support, I, I actually am pretty practical. I don't care how we get to making sure everybody has health insurance, whether it's through private insurance or a public option in the, in the Oregon health plan. I just want to see people have access to affordable health because I think that is takes such a burden off of all of us to do whether it's a small business owner you know whether you're um, you know just a family you know trying to support your family you just worry about so much less you make decisions differently when you're not worried about honestly I my, my dream was to have 500 acres out in Powell View that was you know how families make those negotiations right so my wife had to sell the job with health and so we stuck with that. But anyway, you know, the point is that that decision was made because of health insurance. And we make a lot of those decisions because it's so important. And, you know, it's terrifying. And you, think, and, and, you know, uh, we, when it happens to your friends and family, you see it happens. You know, I always think, you know, I'm, I'm, now I'm 52, and I never, up until last year, I was like, yeah, I can lift anything. You know, lift this, no problem. And now I'm, I'm really careful. I barely lift 10 pounds, and I get nervous. So... You know, you don't think about it until after it happens. So health insurance is really one of my top priorities. Thank you, Brian. So what I want to do is, in the interest of time, I'm not going to stop anybody from asking questions, but I'm going to ask the panel to keep your answers down to two minutes, okay, so that we can get along so we don't get, try to not get too white wordy. <laughs> we'll try to keep it down to two minutes. Okay, uh, we'll go here and then I'll come right back. Hi, I'm Jerry Kelly, and my question is about voter integrity and where you stand on that. We have issues in our county. We've been doing uh, voter canvassing. We're finding discrepancies, and uh, we'd like to see it cleaned up. We personally, I'd like to see one day vote, uh, voter ID, paper ballots, and a so where did each one of you stand on voter integrity? Okay, everybody understand the question? Okay, we'll start off with you, Brent. Uh, well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't, can't speak, to, I've only been to the, um, the clerk's office in the Shoots County. I haven't seen how it happens in Clamish. But, I mean, we do have a very um, effective, and as far as I've, what I've seen, a very safe voting system, something that the rest of the country uh, can look to as a model. No, I don't believe that. Uh, yeah. that oh, yeah. Not in Oregon. Yeah. Mail-in ballot? That's or right. Nothing but fraud. Okay, no, we don't want to get uh, into an argument. I, 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 I have not. So, you know, you've done some research and seen other things. I have not seen that, but, um, but what I've seen and when I've gone into the clerks and watched them count, and that's one thing I would say is go to your county clerk's office um, and spend time in there and watch them count your ballots. Uh, and you know, and they, at least in Deschutes County, they're they're very open, transparent. And they want you to come in because they want you to feel safe. Those people are public servants too, and they're doing the job for you, and they want you to feel secure in your election. So, uh, ultimately, though, to answer the question, I think that voter integrity is critical. I think we have to make sure that our votes count, because that's how our voice is heard. So, I do support voter integrity, but I do think Oregon's system is, uh, it's not flawless, but it's, it's, uh, it's safe. Thank you, Brian. Brandon? So I'll tell you, that I think locally, from a Klamath County perspective, I think our clerk's office does a really good job with what they have to work with and things of that nature. 
Um, is it perfect? Probably not. Are there people on the rolls that probably you know should be you know shouldn't be there and things like that? That probably is. Um, there's not a county on, in this country where that's not going to be the case. Doesn't mean we can't work towards perfection always, but understanding that we you know we have to work towards that. I think Plano County does a fair job at that. Now, with that said, I am fine to go back to paper ballots and you know voter ID and one day voting and all of those things because it's worked well in 48 other states, I believe, and you know it's worked well for 100 and some odd years or to almost 200 and some odd years. So I think you know our, our system of government was founded upon it. Um, I think it's worked well for us. So I have no objection to going back to that, but it's a state issue. You know, the state makes those makes that decision for us, unfortunately. Thank you, Brandon. David? So I think our system's broken, and I think that uh, our government all too often will try to find a solution um, to make things easier, and what they're really doing is making it more complicated and, and allowing there to be avenues of fraud and voter, um, voter fraud. So one of the things I find a lot of times with politicians is they don't want to hit the redo button and back up and start over, but this is one of those issues we need to hit the reset button and go back to show up in person, show me your ID, there's a ballot over there against the wall, punch your, punch your ballot and uh, you know, see what can be done. But um, we definitely do have an issue and voting is one of our constitutional rights, it's one of our most privileged rights, but yet there's all kinds of uh, fraud within that system. So. We need to hit a redo button. Thank you, Dave. Jim? Well, for myself personally, uh, I don't mind doing the ballot, but I see the points, okay? I see the points of going back, like David just said. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we could do that, but you know, is it going to get done? That's the other question. It's simplified to do the ballots as far as mail in. Uh, it's easier to fill out the ballot and put the mail and then drop it off either at the box the drop-off boxes or put it in the U.S. mail. But I heard a conversation earlier, basically, I guess, that, you know, there may be a problem with the U.S. Uh, mail department, but hey, I, I don't work there, so I have no idea, so I can't say and without doing a story or doing a research, you know, to find out, to get the facts, not, not opinion. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, as far as I know from the statistics, as far as Oregon, from what I'm mentioning off the top of my head, so far, you know, I, I don't have a problem with mail in ballots. But I don't have a problem with if we want to go back to it. it there's an old saying, and I just love it. Um, here's the old saying If you want to do something about it, don't talk about it. Get off your butt and do something about it. Don't sit there and moan and groan, oh, it's all bad this way, that way. Well, then get out there and make a difference. Spend your time doing it like other people do. It, it's okay to complain. But talk is cheap. Do something if you want. To, you want to see the change? Get off your butt and make something, make a difference. That's what I do. Thanks, James. Go ahead. Ed. I can tell you, if I could outlaw mail-in ballots, I'd do it right now. Yeah. Um, that's out of my power at this time. But uh, if I could, I'd definitely do it in a heartbeat. Um, I can remember in my younger years, we looked forward to going to cast our ballot and give our signatures. And after Todd and I were gracefully enough to be invited to be observers for the election. Uh, it was amazing how many questions that we both came up with. And we've been working together to try to solve those problems and get answers to why there's uh, these deficiencies in the system that we can plainly see. Uh, do I trust it? Absolutely not. Uh, does it need work? A lot. It looks like somebody tried to reinvent the wheel instead of fixing the flat. Uh, we don't need that, and it costs more money. Go back to counting the ballots like we did. Um, we have received some information, but it's been very resistant in coming, and it was very made very clear to us that there will be no more interaction and it's over, it's done. And I'm like, wow, is this the way you treat your observers? And this is the answers that you're going to give the taxpayer about their votes? Um, there's just so many more questions to have. Did it get a little better from what we saw the prior year? 
it appears that it got a little better, but it's got a long ways to go. Um, and we're still working very hard uh, with voter clarity, and it's just, it's a never ending saga that we're going to continue to fight, and we're never going to get up, give up on that. And that's one of my, I, I know for a fact Todd feels the same way I do about it. We we'll work as hard as we can, whoever makes it there. To make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Todd? My uh, brother passed away three weeks ago from a heart attack at age 48, and he lived downtown Portland um, on Second and Pine. He worked for the blood, um, bl um, Red Cross, and he, uh, blood. he drew the blood. Flawless. And um, I'm wondering who's going to get his ballot at his apartment. So am I against mail in ballots? Probably. I would be happy to switch the system, and I think um, we need to get that on the ballot next time we do it, and we can start getting our signatures and try to get it back to no mail-in ballots. We do it in person if you want to vote. Um, now, I know that makes it harder for some of your rural areas. You've got to actually take a trip and come down to Klamath or come here or go to the post office or wherever it is. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to all of us that we do that. After going through the class, um, my big thing was, is, hey, we got a live stream. Turn it on from first ballot till till certification and the county clerk's answer was no we're going to turn it on only when uh, we don't have a in, if there's an in-person doing it there we're going to turn it off so if you go to your website and see it's turned off and that means somebody's watching otherwise it's supposed to be turned on um, so anyway that's what we that's the answer we got um, we didn't get what we wanted but um, or at least our recommendation wasn't taken but that's okay you know that's we got an answer and Rochelle Long has been good about giving answers so Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Todd. So let's go to this side of the room if you have a question. And I do have, if anybody knows the answer, just give me the answer. I was asked by a gentleman, what is the annual salary of a commissioner? 80, How much? 80,000. 80, I thought it was 60, so 80,000. Okay, there's your answer. <laughs> one quick one. Uh, does anybody know about the truly what the water situation is with our lakes, like Crescent Lake, uh, Wiki Up, and all that. I mean, they're here in Clam County, and I mean, they're just being drained down. I've been hearing so many different uh, people saying, well, it's because of an environmental issue on a frog, uh, or they need the water down in the bend area to keep the shoot. Well, what's the situation? I mean, it's, uh, people can't even put their boats in the water. Hey, does it, you know, everybody start with, uh, who's got the mic? Uh, Todd, you got the mic there. They want you to know about the water situation. I went and looked at Crescent Lake today. Uh, my wife and I heard there were some white sands out there. So we went and checked on it, walked out of the docks, met the maintenance man at the, at the resort there. And uh, I went out and looked myself. And it does look like water level is down. You know, I don't know exactly what's the, I, I haven't even looked at the tributary system here, so I don't understand what is going on with the water uh, in that way, but I, I did make the time, take the time to go out there and look myself today, so um, I'm, I, I have some learning to do along with you. Todd, thank you, Todd. Alan? Uh, I can't say that I'm totally familiar with your water problems up here compared to Clatton County and the farmers. So very devastating. Um, anytime there's water involved and there's a shortage, yes. Um, I didn't make a trip to Crescent, even though it's one of my favorite lakes up here. Um, but water shortages are here. How bad they are? Um, they don't sit be near as bad as they were when I moved here, when I was able to walk across the bottom of the lakes in some places. So, um, thank God we're not there yet. Hopefully we won't be there this year. and We'll get a good rainfall next year, but to answer your question, um, every time I turn around and read something, the federal government seems to have their footprint in somewhere about uh, a fish, a frog, nothing against that. Um, you know, we do need to save our wildlife. But again, um, who comes first, man or the frog or the fish? Uh, yeah, we need them both, but we also need our existence. And water is one thing that every human creature in, on earth needs. So we, do we need to respect it? Absolutely. But we need to get the government footprint out of our face 
so we can use the water because those people up in Washington, D.C., they don't know anything about us. They send people down to do these environmental impact studies and then they bring the information back and then they send, send, they send people down to say, this is the way you're going to do it. And it's like, what do you know about the way we live? Absolutely nothing. So is there some tweaking that can be done to that? Less government footprint is what, I, what I'm looking at. Thank you. Thank you. James? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have an answer except for one little thing. I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the water. Right here. But yet, we have a main manufacturers or whatever else that are taking the water, but I guess there's not a problem with that, right? I mean, if we're going to conserve water, then this needs to stop. Even though we all enjoy drinking our bottle of water, don't we? But, you know, if we sit back and complain that we don't have enough water, we all got to start working against this too because this is a waste I mean I, I when I grew up I mean I'm 67 years old we didn't have this okay we wanted to drink we wanted to drink water we went over to the water mountain and that's where we got our water okay we didn't carry our water bottles with us okay that's I'm not saying that's a solution but that's also a problem as far as you know the water situation where uh, uh, major companies come in and they take the water that actually should be going to the farmers and everybody else that lives in that particular area instead of somebody else's bank account. Thank you, James. Hey. So I owe you an apology because I don't know your answer. I haven't looked into it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a little naive in regards to what's going on with your lake system up here and your watershed. So I'm, I'm going to look into that. I've spent a great deal of, of my time dealing with the water issue in the Klamath Basin. My wife and I own, like I told you, 5-H Cattle Company, and we have four water contracts, and I haven't got a drop of water. This will be the third year. So we've had some hardships. We've had to adjust our business model and figure out a way to scratch and, and try to be successful with our business in, in light of not growing anything on our farmland. So um, thank you for bringing that up, because you opened my eyes that, you know, it's not all just about the basin. So I'll look into that, but I don't have your answer. I've, I've been focused on, on water in the basin. Thanks, Dave. Brandon? So really quick, I just kind of a show of hands. How many are on city water here and versus, okay, most everybody? Okay. I, I know in the south part of the county, we have a, a good portion of our domestic wells that are going dry. Uh, we're facing that up here um, in Crescent. I've worked with uh, the state over the last year um, to try and truck water in, and we're trucking it to the south as well. Um, if you have an existing domestic well that is failing, you need to call the water master, okay? Because that's, first and foremost, that's where you're gonna get help, okay? It's gonna get us, you know, be able to get you some relief and be able to get you, you know, even if we're trucking water to you in the short term and helping find a, uh, a, a well driller to deepen a well or something like that, um, those are the things we need to do. Um, with respect to the city well, I know that the, um, one of the, working with the state that we have, uh, another well that's getting ready to be been permitting it at this point. Um, I think there was some questions on that that uh, come up in, in the last few weeks. So um, it's it's an issue I have a little bit of peripheral understanding of, not to the probably the extent that you have here. But the other big thing is we've had a lot of years of drought and we're not getting enough water over the winter. And that is you know we're facing our third year of exceptional drought that runs right up through Klamath County, and that that is probably one of the main things, and then the federal government telling us what we can do with water is another big headache that we have to deal with. Thank you, Brandon. Brian? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of it's been said. I think with Wikiup specifically, there is, uh, is an issue with the frogs, so there's a, that is an endangered species, and so water is being released at a higher rate than it has in the past. Um, but uh, that's not the only issue. The issue, the issue is that we have an extended drought that's been going on for years, and so we just haven't had the refill and recharge. And that's why groundwater, and you really see things like that underground, you know, over time. It takes time for those to develop. When you start seeing wells go dry, uh, lapine, which was, you know, for a long time known as, I mean, you couldn't put a septic system in a lot of places because the water table was high. Now they're, they're having wells go dry in La Um and so the water table is dropping, you know, um, in the 
medium term, I mean, I think, you know, we won't have these droughts forever, but we need, to, we need to learn how to manage, especially as more people continue coming in, we have an over-allocated resource. We do have to learn how to use it more efficiently, and we also have to do things like, you know, with rural areas, I think probably looking at helping people form water districts, it's a lot cheaper to put in a deep well that services a community, even if it's, even if it's a distributed community, than putting in 50 or 100, you know, medium depth wells. You know, so so trying to get people to work together, and that's a, that's what things a state, you know, state funding can help with, state support, uh, and in the short term, doing things that like there was, I think unfortunately, if you haven't already applied for it, the deadline passed on April 30th for Klamath County um, for for this four million dollars that came from the state for kind of emergency. So when we're in a drought, it's, it really is the state's responsibility to help folks out, come in and provide that, make sure that support is there, um, and I would support that. Thank you, Brian. So we've heard their opinions on water, fire, police, political uh, balloting, and uh, bringing um, maybe uh, some personal stuff into elections. Is there anybody else that has different questions so that we can move on? Hang on just a minute, we'll come back to this gentleman on this side. Thank you, I appreciate you guys all taking time from your family and businesses and coming this far to give us a piece of, piece of your time. Um, all of you guys have answered a lot of questions, but the uh, retired police chief, I would like to, your input on what we as voters and taxpayers can do to actually change the dynamics of our police service up here. And the fire is an equally as important, but I think those two topics affect my mind the most. And uh, you've obviously spent a, min a bunch of your life dedicated to that. And I was wondering if you had some insight that you could share where we could actually facilitate change with our voice and our vote. Dave? That's an awesome question. Thank you. I, I think the simple fact that you asked that question is very motivational and inspiring to me because you want to be in, engaged and involved. I think that's very, very powerful. Um, I brought it up a couple times, so I'm going to try to say something new. but. The advisory team that I established when I was the chief in Climate Falls was just for that reason. So I met with a group across, a very broad cross-section of our community on a regular basis and just simply asked questions of them. How do you want me to police? What are your goals for this city? What do you want to look like in 10 years? What do you need from me as your police chief for you to feel successful as a community? So I would say the same type of thing to you today. Stay involved, stay engaged, Vote, pick up the phone, call your sheriff and talk to your sheriff about, hey, we've got some issues with policing. Can we have a community forum up here and have you come up, sheriff, so we can share some ideas with you? And then, and then be engaged in that process with the sheriff. Um, when it comes time for budgeting, be a part of that budget hearing and listen to what the sheriff is asking for and, and make your, your voice heard. Um, at the budget hearing this year, when the sheriff was giving his proposal for the budget, he was actually asked by somebody on the budget committee, well, what about if the city took over the PD or took over policing? What, what would that look like? And I'm not going to quote the sheriff. You can go on YouTube and you can read what he said. Um, but he did say the current policing model is unfair to the rural community. That's you. So he understands that and he recognizes it. And I've had conversations with the sheriff years back. I sat down with him and said, hey, listen, I can make you a hero, Sheriff. Let me have the UGB, and let's push the deputies out into the rural community. So it's not a brand new idea for the Sheriff. He just has to get there. And I think being involved, being engaged, being proud of who you are in your community and speaking your mind and speaking your voice is very, very powerful. So I think I'd say that and, and invite the Sheriff out here to give you his thoughts as well so you can hear from him what he needs from you to be successful. Thank you, Dave. Okay, uh, now we've heard more about the police. We got a different subject. You have a different subject? Okay. My concern is new people that come to the area. I'm fairly new to the area. I've only been here for four years. Um, one of the biggest things that I have come across is 
internet service being available to people, and the lack of any communication on any of the networks about news in Klamath County. I have no idea how to get any news about Klamath County or anybody that's on the in the election until pamphlets like what this lady has is sent to us in the mail. Is there a way to cure that? So I'll kick that off if you don't mind. Go ahead, Brent. One of the things I do, I serve as a public information officer for the sheriff, and I'll tell you, we live, we live in a news desert, unfortunately. Um, you know, we have a newspaper down in Final Falls that um, has gone through some tough times. Right now they have, they, they, they have reporters that are um, writing stories from Florida. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. We don't have a TV, we don't have a TV station any longer down there. Um, things of that nature. Up, up here, you guys probably get more of your news from Ben than you do from, you know, Medford or Planet. And, yeah, and that's and that's always going to be, you know, unfortunately that's a challenge. So, I don't have an answer for it other than I understand it and I understand the issue because, you know, when we try and get information out, sometimes there's nobody to give it to. And so, one of the things we did was, you know, we, we established a Facebook page. We, you know, we were a little slower to social media than some of the other agencies. Partly because you know of the management piece of it, you got to have somebody there to you know respond to comments or you know things of that nature, and we were a little concerned with that for a while. So, um, but we made that leap, and so we're trying to get more information directly out to people via social media and things of that nature. Thank you, Brandon. Is any of the other panel have an answer? I mean, I okay. um, you know as a candidate and who doesn't live in this area. I listen to, you have two Facebook pages now, uh, Press of Gilcrest, and then Friends of Press of Gilcrest, I guess. There's some for us, too. What's well, that? The subdivisions in the area also have their Yeah, I mean, it's a, it is, a, I mean, news in general in the United States right now is under, you know, all, all local, local news, I should say, is really under a lot of pressure. It's really a challenge. Uh, so I don't have a direct answer because the economics are the, the challenge for them. Because you know, most of their revenue used to come from advertisement, and when the eyes go to the internet instead of to the newspaper, that's a problem. Uh, what I would set, suggest, and this is you know easy to say from my seat, you know living closer to Ben, I get the bulletin and um, some other papers. It's just easy for me to say, but it's to maybe start your own setup. You know, something find a volunteer who wants to report on local issues and stuff. I, I, you know, that's the best I can say, and then. Um, I don't know, but I, I, I'll think, I'm thinking about it, because I, I actually haven't really thought of that issue, so I'm trying to understand how the state, because that, that would be my role as a state representative, how can the state support news deserts in rural areas? I mean, I, I have a lot of affinity for rural living and rural folks, and want to, that's what I, why I'm in this, I want to support us. Um, but I'm I'm close, you know, closer to the big you know, So you're more, much more rural than I am here. So how can I support you? I'll, I'll be thinking about that. Uh, but I think in the short term, try to try, maybe try to get if somebody has some time to go and start t telling story, telling your own stories. You know, storytelling is a great profession. Thank you, Brian. Does anybody else on the panel have a comment on that? Uh, the reason why I do is because I've been doing it for 13 years on my own. And somebody in this local community could do the work, okay? Uh, like I do. I do it for free. To do it for free for 13 years. I started in, a pop in, in Tule Lake, a population of 1,000. So uh, I don't know what the exact population here is in this rural community. But somebody could do it. I mean, all it is is a little bit of ink and paper, okay? And I do my own stories because uh, I want to get the word out, the story out there, and I want to be able to, to tell that story and not have to worry about advertisers or losing my advertisers, okay? Or ads. I don't have any ads. I haven't had ads for 13 years, but I'm still doing it for free. And I'm retired. And same thing with my radio show. I mean, I do it for free. I mean, if somebody here can do it, and the way it works like with, with HP, if you get an HP printer, uh, HP pays for the ink. Like my, it only costs me like $25 a month 
for 700 pages. They are print with the different stories and the different articles. And I do a couple articles a, a, a week, or, or not a week, but you know, one, one a week or two a week or even one, one a month. And, and, you know, 100 copies, 200 copies. I mean, it does, you know, but I'm getting the stories out there. But I'm doing it out of my own pocket. And because that way I have control of what the news, but I, I research it, I'm not fake news, okay? Uh, but I do the story, you know, whatever my opinion is, I put it out, it's out of my own pocket. And I don't, like I said, I don't worry about ads. So anybody here could do the same thing I do. And then one, one real quick thing, uh, recently I, I bought a couple of TVs, I got a, a big screen and a little screen, I use it for my radio show for the videos. But mostly everything's turned into wireless now, or as far as, there's no more cable hardly. I mean, as far as communities getting access to the news. The cable you know, is, is and the same thing with satellite. It's too expensive. But if you can get, the, get your news right up the channels, right off your internet connection. Thank you, James. A lot of people don't have the same talent you have, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Anybody else have a comment on that? Very quickly. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I don't know. Everybody knows the Herald of News down in the, our area. Well, recently, most all of the employees walked off. Uh, don't know what the reasons are, but it kind of left the paper in a little bit of a shortage of people. Uh, I would most likely look into the college and reach in to see if we can start an internship program where we can have journalists come up here and bring stories to you. Um, and it would be for free because it would be a school classroom. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a news broadcast person of any kind. But in short, that's what I would try to accomplish to bring you um, a, situ a solution to your situation. Um, Todd is pretty, he's into it. He probably can answer your question in more detail. But uh, uh, otherwise, I've always resorted to ham radio and CB for information. Thank you, Alan Todd. I'll make mine quick. Um, I read all 437 pages of the American Rescue Act, and there is money to hook up rural communities with broadband and water and, um, and, uh, and, and, and electricity. So uh, that may be something you want to look into and, and, and try to talk to your current county commissioners and get a grant in to, to connect your community. Because there is there are millions of dollars that are available as grant money to do to bring broadband to your area. So that's something that's a benefit, and check it out. Thank you, Todd. Okay, we've heard about that. Has anybody else got a different question? I have a different question. And I don't know what the scope of your particular offices are, but I know that Southern Oregon has a real problem with illegal cannabis grows. And my concern is the water consumption, the water theft, and the poisoning of the land. I mean, if someone wants to smoke a J, that's cool. But these people are just raping our land and our water supply, right? So what can, and governor is not sending in the National Guard to take care of these. Are you guys just playing whack-a-mole? They're just ignoring them? Why can't, what can your office do? Can you call and say, hey, I've got an illegal grow 10 miles outside of wherever, or here in Lapine, or here in Crescent. Send in the National Guard to get rid of these people. I think we just have to crush them, crush them, crush them, so they stop trying to, because I don't see it getting better, and they're just taking people's water. What can what can you what can your office do? Not oh, what can you legally do? What can you do to support Southern Oregon in getting rid of illegal marijuana growers? So I'll start off on that. Um, being an employee of the sheriff's office, I'll tell you that um, one of the things we've tried to do this year is we, we've tried to take the fight to them a little bit sooner. Um, we've not had a lot of success in years past. Last year, the number of grows we took down um, roughly 130,000 plants, I believe it was. And when we calculated the, the amount of water used for that, uh, we estimated that we lost over 30 million gallons of water last year um, to illegal, just to the illegal marijuana grows that we busted. And we feel like we barely scratched the surface. So 
one of the things we're doing, we're, we're trying to put better information out there. Um, you guys can report. So uh, there's an email address that goes directly into the detective that actually works at, works in marijuana right now. That's mjtipline at climathcounty.org. If you're just barely scratching the surface, how can you get, where do you get more resources to scratch that surface further? So in the legislative session, they approved more counties to get um, additional funding, some grant funding. There's five counties involved. Um, they may know a little bit more about that, but I know Sheriff has applied for, or is finishing up an application to apply for some of that funding that the legislature just approved. Uh, basically, it's going to add a couple million dollars over, over two years um, to be able to add more deputies, to be able to bust more grows, and things like that. Why can't we use the National Guard? Because the governor won't approve it. That, that's that plain and simple. The governor will not approve it. Jackson County did an emergency declaration. Um, for the National Guard, the governor wouldn't approve it. She would not. She won't send them. And it's up to her, unfortunately. Well, the National Guard already is committed to that with their RAID program, so that's an untrue statement that the National Guard isn't working it. RAID's been involved for the last 20 years, and that's what they do specifically is drug interdiction. Fair enough, but when Jackson County did an emergency declaration, asking for additional guard resources, the governor said no. So, I mentioned once before that I, I started the base interagency narcotics team when I was the chief in Klamath Falls, and, and that team is also responsible for illegal marijuana grows everywhere in Klamath County, and they do help the sheriff's office with that quite a bit. We did bring in the National Guard, one of the members of the guard has an office at Klamath Falls Police Department, um, so we brought in a bunch of outside assets to help with that team as well. So it wasn't specifically just for marijuana. It was for all drugs, but they did target illegal marijuana grows. And if you could ever find an article in the paper, you could see where they've taken down some of those illegal grows as well. Um, the other thing that I would add is code enforcement is extremely important on the back side of that as well. And as the chief in Klamath, what I did was I took the elite, or I took the marijuana money that we were getting, because the marijuana money from the sales of marijuana was to be used for enforcement. So I bought more code enforcement officers with the marijuana money. So I was like, hey, I'll just take your money and take the fight back to you through code enforcement. So I'm a huge advocate of taking the fight to them, as Brandon put it. I think that is really smart, and I've proven to this county on multiple times that uh, I'm not afraid to stand up to illegal drugs in any regards. Thank you. But we're losing half of our audience here because we're running so late. So, um, it, what's your question, sir? Uh, it's on the drug subject. Pardon me? It's on the drug subject. I want to talk to the chief. Okay, so let's do this. Let's give these guys a few minutes to tell you why they still should be your candidate for the position. And then let them go into the audience and you guys can ask them individual questions. So we can uh, keep the keep the ball rolling here. Is that is that fair? Everybody say that's fair. I'd like to explain to them what our problem is with water because they don't. Dave, understand. we know what the problem. You and I know what the problem is with water. These guys have to learn it, so we'll let them learn it. So we'll start off with Todd. You have a couple of minutes just to say why you need to be commissioner here in Klamath County. Well, I'm a first time, it'll be my first time serving, so if you want to start fresh, um, you know, first time public servant. I've had background you know, in the private, in the nonprofit sector as well as the for profit sector. I'm a journalist, I'm curious about life. I've already met with the sheriff, and my suggestion was you know, again, our coats, we, we slap a $750 fine on them, you know, when we run across the, the water issues or the, 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 the marijuana stuff. And give them 90 days to pay. We need to make that raise that up to ten thousand dollars, so we can actually foreclose on them or, or go after them. And we need to educate other people around here not to lease their land to people they don't know. You know, we have a lot of absentee owners out here that are leasing their land. So you know, there's a responsibility that comes with that. Or there needs to be a clause in there that says if you're leasing the land. What if there's illegal activity on it? You're responsible for it. So there's some things that we can do. Um, I went to school for six months in Singapore, and Lee Kuan Yew, the president there, he said, if you do drugs, we hang you. And I think it's a real problem that, that and he's done that. Um, 
and they don't have a drug, a big drug problem there. Very rarely do they do they have drugs passing through there. So I went to our commissioners two weeks ago, and I said, let's be tougher than all the other surrounding com uh, counties. That's that's where we got to start. We got to be tougher than Josephine County. We've got to make our fines bigger for illegal drugs and for and, and put up some perhaps even some license. Um, license plate scanning cameras on some of these rural roads that are where they're hauling water. So we can see, because if they're hauling water on a tanker four times a day, that's not domestic water anymore. So anyway, those are some ideas, but we don't want a police state either, so there's a balance that we have to decide what we want to do as a community. Anyway, I'm looking forward to serving for you. Um, fresh and space and race. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, I definitely wouldn't be a stranger to you up here, that's for sure. I'd make it a point to come up here to your meetings to participate in the local concerns that you have, and that's a promise. Um, if there's anything left of the 50% of my salary that I have committed uh, to return to Klamath County to help in any areas that it can. So I come without any special interests, uh, no ties, and no baggage. So. Like Todd, I'm fresh, and there's nothing attached to me to slow me down. Um, and as far as the uh, water, uh, illegal grows, uh, the Sprague River it became pretty heated out there. Um, don't definitely won't go into detail, but I went out to Bly and I talked to a gentleman out there. He wants to build his house. He can't, can't get a permit because. There's 48 keys because it's shared water. They're all gone, but there's only 36 houses there. He said, we see people come in constantly and take water out. And I said, did you follow one of them? Yes, it went into a locked compact. Well, there we are. Somebody that has control of water that could be most likely being used for illegal sources. I said, did you take the license plate number down and report it? He goes, no, but I'm going to. So it's a proactive thing every needs, everybody needs to participate in. Uh, there's no immediate answers I can, I can tell you. Uh, I'm not in a position of um, any type of power uh, or office like Brandon Fowler or the sheriff, so I can't comment on what they would do. But I would definitely try to bring in uh, federal troops to help. And since it is drugs, I don't know what the capabilities are, but I think there would be some way that you could involve them, especially in the groves. And um, when they approach the uh, $750 uh, charge and then increase it, I mentioned, well, shouldn't we have a tier system? Because I don't think anybody here wants a $10,000 fine for a code enforcement violation. So I would. Definitely look into making sure it was a tiered system so that drug dealers would definitely have the brunt of the punishment and the homeowners like ourselves would be left alone to continue living our lives as we would like to. Thank you very much. So James is the only candidate here who is running against somebody. We're going to let him say that. So the rest of them here are position one. James is for position two, which is against Kelly Minty Moore. So why Thank do you, you want to be in charge? I was going to, well, that, that's what I was going to bring to the point. <laughs> the two people, candidates on this side, they're running for position one. The two on this side, position one. I just got stuck in the middle, but that's okay. It works out. It works out just fine. I was going to start off going, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to San Jose. I'm doing okay. But uh, the reason, I just want to make a difference, okay? I'm a senior citizen. I'm 67 years old. And I, I'm a little tired of uh, career politicians, okay? Uh, my opponent, we're, we're on good terms. But that's the good thing about it. We're on good terms. But eight years she has had. It's time for some new blood. It's time for new ideas. I have a large resume too. I've got, I have a lot of experience. And I, when we first started, I explained and, and, and mentioned a lot of the things. I just mentioned them all, okay? But I have a lot of experience and knowledge. I don't have all the answers, just like anything else. I have to research the uh, situation in order to come up with a a viable solution to the problems that we're all facing. This is about us. 
It's not about, like I said before, it's not, this is not a, a, a political debate. It should not be. It's about the people, all of us together. I don't care which political party you belong to. This is a nonpartisan position, and that's how it should be approached, in my opinion. I'm not affiliated with the left, the right, or even a religious organization, because it's about the people. And the people, who are the people? You are the people. And I, and I know people from the less fortunate all the way up to people in power. I'm sitting next to one that I did know as the former chief of police. So I mean, and my former uh, attorney, she's now a judge in the circuit county. My uh, MD is the vice president of Skylake Medical Center. So I, I have knowledge from people from um, all walks of life, and I'm in this zero budget because I want to make a difference. Thank you, James. I've got 28 years of dedicated and committed law enforcement service, which is a public servant. That's what I've done my entire adult life, is representing people. And I think that I've proven myself to Climate County to be somebody that thinks outside the box, that comes up with new ideas, has creative solutions, and we actually get some things done. I'm not running for this position because I want to be a career politician. I think that I'm running for this position for you. I want to be your champion, I want to be your voice, I want to be your advocate. I want to talk to you, listen to you, come up with some cool, creative new ideas and try to get some things accomplished in our county. Yeah, I get, I get asked all the time, why don't, why don't we get things done? And I think to myself, well, I don't think to myself, I say out loud, there's a couple of reasons. People lack political will. When they get into a, a political position, they want to keep that position for their income or their career. I'm not looking for another career. I'm certainly not looking for income. I'm, I'm looking to represent you. Take the fight to Salem. Take the fight to D.C. so we can have local control. We can keep Klamath County the special place Klamath County is. And I think I've got the education, I've got the experience, and I've got the know-how to make it happen. So I ask you for your vote. God bless you all. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Brandon, why do you want to be commissioner? Well, for 25 years, I've served in the uh, private sector. I've run a business. Um, I've, I've led organizations. I've managed budgets over $100 million a year, and I've managed organizations with over 100 people in it. So I have a lot of experience in doing that. Um, in recent years, um, I've changed and I've moved, moved on to helping my community you know, as county emergency manager and public information officer for the sheriff's office. Um, the other thing I didn't get a chance to tell you about tonight, I've also served on the board of directors and budget committee for Chilliquin Fire and Rescue uh, for much of the last 20 years as I've lived in this community. So I've been here, I've been working on these challenges, um, I've been working on public safety issues for all of the last 20 years in, in my free time, and been working on it for the last three years uh, already for you. And so for me, serving as your county county commissioner is an extension of what I already do. And that's what I want to do for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Ryan, why do you want to be commissioner? I don't want to be commissioner. Uh, <laughs> so last name's Lepore, L-E-P-O-R-E, LeporeforOregon.com. You can check me out. Uh, I'm a former small fa uh, farmer, soil scientist, a dad, and uh, I love central and south central Oregon. I just love this area that we live in. I want to spend this time that I have, the ability, ability that I have to help out. That's why I'm running and I want to, I mean, this has been great. Thank you for spending time telling me what your concerns are so I can learn from you. Uh, when you send, come to bring it to Salem, I hope to be there and to listen to you, Dave, and or whoever it is. But basically to get that voice, be the person in Salem who helps support our rural communities. Um, you know, my, the things that motivated me were housing, drought uh, and health care, but now I've got some new things to motivate me as I go, and that's what this whole process is. You tell me what's going on, and I respond accordingly. That's how I am the job. So I hope you get your vote and your support. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. I want to thank the panel and there are all these uh, people who want to be commissioner. All of them are on position one, except for James, who wants to be on position two. Thank you for coming, and thank you for the community club for uh, giving us this privilege of having the facility. So, if you have more questions, get with these guys and ask your questions. Thanks for coming.